OK, so today's class is kind of broadly about two things. It's about uh, data sets in machine learning, and it's about ethics in machine learning, and kind of like the implications kind of that are brought on by modern machine learning techniques. OK, so again, I think I mentioned this in the first class, that I feel like it's kind of important for me to put this up front instead of like deferring it towards like the end of the semester when everyone's already checked out. Because you know, even though we're going to learn pretty fundamental basic textbook machine learning algorithms in this class, I think it's important to think about like, OK, well, you know, how are these machine learning algorithms used and deployed in the real world in ways that impact you? And where did the training data for all these machine learning algorithms come from? OK, so I mean, the data sets in particular are key to the way modern machine learning has developed, right? We couldn't do anything if we didn't collect data sets for the community to start developing algorithms with, right? Uh, and so certainly in the age of generative AI, where you know, mid-journey and stable diffusion and so on are trained on kind of unfathomable amounts of training data, even back in the day, you know, nothing really happened until there was kind of enough consistent data for people to start to train their algorithms on. And certain uh, sub, you know, whole, whole disciplines like computer vision have really been transformed by this kind of paradigm of publicly available data sets, right? So let me just kind of first talk about, you know, what do I even mean when I'm, start, when I'm talking about a data set, right? So data sets, you know, for machine learning, basically, you know, um, there's this paradigm that we call the training and testing paradigm, right? So kind of the idea is that I have a data set that I got from somewhere, we'll talk about that, and a portion of that data set is what we call training data, and a portion of that data set is called testing data. And so the idea is that we keep on, you know, tweaking our parameters on the training part of the data, that's how we help our algorithm get better and better until we've gotten kind of the best performance that we can on the training data. And then we, you know, evaluate how well we did on the testing data. And kind of a critical kind of axiom of this whole approach is that you can't train your algorithm on the testing data, right? In some sense, the philosophy is that the testing data is sacrosanct, right? It's put off to the side. You don't even look at it until you're done training your algorithm. And then you see how you did, right? And the goal is that the training data and the testing data should hopefully, if you're thinking about probability, have the same kind of probability distribution, right? So that the training data is representative of the testing data. Obviously, if there's stuff in the testing data that you never saw in the training data, then you, you know, can't be expected to predict that stuff, right? So for example, my student right now working on a paper involving, you know, anomaly detection in a street scene, right? And so he was telling me just this morning that like, you know, uh, in the train data, there are no parked cars in this one region of the scene. And in the testing data, there's a, there's a car parked there. And so even though it's a, a certainly a valid place to park your car, since we didn't see it in the train data, when you see it in the testing data, it comes up as an anomaly, even though it shouldn't be flagged as anomalous, right? So we really can't do anything about that because the train data had something kind of missing that was revealed in the testing data, right? So, so that kind of thing is tough. You have to kind of curate your data set, hopefully in such a way that these things are representative. And so this idea of, um, you know, taking some data, you know, the data comes from somewhere. We'll talk about that in a second. This whole idea of this part and this part is called a split, right? So the idea is that, you know, benchmark data sets that we shall talk about have a fixed training slash testing split. Meaning that it's kind of known that when you download this data set, that say this, you know, this set of 10,000 vectors is your training data, and this set of 2,000 vectors is your testing data, and that split is fixed for everyone who evaluates their algorithm on the data, right? If everyone got to make their own like 10,000, 2,000 split, then we couldn't really like easily compare different algorithms on the same data set, right? So we have to have everyone on the same kind of level playing field, right? Um, a slightly different way of doing it, and this kind of comes into play when you're talking about things like Kaggle competitions or kind of big prizes, is what you may have is something that's more like, um, you, know, uh, you know, for kind of, you know, big competitions, what you may have is kind of public training data, and then 
you have kind of like what's called like a leaderboard. So there's like a public leaderboard on some set of testing data. So everyone can see how well they're doing. And then maybe over here, there's kind of like some sort of a secret or holdout data set that only, for example, the sponsor of the competition has access to, right? So this way, the competitors can see kind of how they're doing compared to each other, but there's still some sort of like totally untested data that the, that the you know, organizer is gonna say, okay, we're now we're gonna test on this data that you've never seen before, right? Because I have to say that, you know, they work, watch my language, right? But the basic philosophy is that the, the testing data in this example is totally fresh to the algorithm, right? That the algorithm's never seen it before, and hence it's fair to say, okay, well, I did all this work on the, on the training data, and then I'm gonna now apply the testing data to see how well I did, right? But I have to say that this is, uh, I don't wanna say bullshit, but I will say it's bullshit, right? So basically, the way it works in the real world I'm a computer vision guy, right? I'm trying to get the best results on the leaderboard that I can, right? So in practice, what happens is there's this kind of like meta loop around training and testing, which says that, yes, I design my algorithms on the training data. I never incorporate the testing data into my algorithm design, but then I look and see how well I did on the testing data and say, well, I, could I do better on the testing data? Well, then I go back and I tweak some algorithm parameters in the hopes that my testing data performance gets better, right? So even though I'm not actually training on the testing data, I'm certainly using the testing data in some sort of like bigger feedback loop because when I publish my paper, I want to do as well as I can, right? And this is no big secret, right? This is the way every computer vision and machine learning researcher is going to do it. It's not like they're going to spend six months developing an algorithm and then press play once on a testing data and say, oh, well, I guess it's how well we did and we're gonna publish it now. No, of course, there's this huge meta feedback loop. So I guess that what I would say is that maybe in the early days, this paradigm was kind of like pure and undiluted. These days, you know, the testing data is just kind of like one more, you know, type of training data that we, we, we don't, you know, legitimately directly train the parameters on this, but we do continually update and evaluate to try to get the best performance on the leaderboard that we can, right? So I guess that what I would say is that in practice, you know, let's just say that researchers continually iterate to get the best performance on the testing data. I mean, every modern machine learning paper is like that. Um, the only way that you could avoid this kind of issue is if there was truly this secret holdout data set that was only evaluated once, that researchers never had any access to, that the organizers of the competition only did let you evaluate your data once, right? That kind of thing, you know, is, is very rarely done in any sort of real environment, right? Um, so, you know, that's kind of what I'm saying is take, take this purity of training, testing, split with a grain of salt, even though it is really important to still not just design your algorithm on the entire set of data, you do have to, you know, kind of pay lip service. I, I guess I, as an intro machine learning class, I should be a little more, or should be a little less cynical, but I guess in practice, you know, you really do have to separate your, your main parameters should never be, you know, optimized based on the train, on the testing data, only on the training data, but in practice, you know, you'll kind of have some bigger level concerns, like should I use a neural network that looks like this or a neural network that looks like that, right? That kind of like higher level hyperparameter tuning, trying to get the best performance on the testing data is like not unusual. So we'll talk a little bit in more detail uh, about kind of like this idea that sometimes there's a training set, what's called a validation set and a testing set, but in practice, you know, it's kind of like uh, what I said. So. Um, what I want to talk about here is, you know, the history in some sense of the way machine learning data sets developed, right? So, um, you know, a lot of research is driven by this kind of paradigm of there being a benchmark that everyone can use to compare their data on, right? Um, but that benchmark kind of philosophy didn't like always exist. It didn't exist like in the 1900s, right? So like, when did this start to happen? Well, probably the first, you know, kind of time that this was um, used in some sense, you know, kind of like one of the first machine learning benchmarks was in, you know, 1959, the first machine learning benchmark. 
which was by a guy named Heiliman at Bell Labs. So if you don't know, Bell Labs, you know, used to be kind of like the research arm of the American telephone company. And Bell Labs was a, like the place to go if you wanted to do like pure research in an industrial setting. That was like the primo place to be, you know, kind of comparable to a university in some sense, right? And so uh, that data basically had to do with recognizing characters, right? So there were, you know, uh, 50 different writers, each of whom wrote the 26 letters and the 10 numbers. These are digitized at a 12 by 12 on or off resolution, right? So pretty crude. And the you know, amazing part is that these were basically stored on punch cards, right? Which were what the old computers were only able to recognize, right? So there was no sense of like mailing around a floppy disk or putting it on the website. There was no website, right? So the way this data was distributed was literally by mailing a stack of punch cards to whoever wanted to try to use it. And it was said that only about 20 copies of this data set actually existed that were passed around from person to person, right? So, you know, clearly this was not something that, you know, we, we do now, but I mean, before the internet and before floppy disks and so on, this is what you had to do, right? Um, but the kind of key idea here that still persisted was that this Heilman data kind of did introduce the, you know, first idea of the, you know, kind of training and testing split. And also kind of like the key idea of how we would evaluate an algorithm fairly. You know, kind of before this point, people maybe had their own data sets, but they were not easily distributed, right? So you could certainly write a paper and evaluate your algorithm on this paper, but if no one else can get your data, then it's kind of hard to compare apples to apples on different algorithms, right? So this was really the first such thing that, that moved the field forward, right? So, you know, then lots of stuff happened. I think the next thing I want to talk about was in 1986 was this kind of called the Timit data set. And really this, was, you know, like Texas Instruments MIT is what the TIMIT stands for. Um, and so this was kind of like the precursor to many of the kind of big DARPA competitions. So this was um, something that basically uh, was uh, kind of an audio data set. So this contained um, you know, a fair amount of speakers, right? So basically uh, there were 630 speakers, each of whom said 10 sentences. And the speakers and sentences that, you know, were used look something like this, right? So these are kind of like slightly weird contrived sentences. Part of the idea was to exercise all the different sounds that you can make in the English language in a bunch of sentences, right? So she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year, right? These are the kinds of sentences that were read. Um, and so 10 of these were selected by each person more or less. And then what you can see on the right-hand side is kind of like a breakdown of male and female speakers and also dialect regions, right? So the dialect regions are like, you know, New England, you know, Northern, Southern, New York City, Western, and then Arby Brat moved around, whatever that means, right? So basically here what you can see is that this is already kind of introducing the fact that there are these definite biases in how the data set was collected, right? So for example, there were not many New England speakers. There were, you know, more than twice as many male speakers as female speakers, right? So this was certainly a good effort versus like no standardized data set at all, but there are definitely significant racial and demographic biases that are inside this data, right? I'm willing to believe that most of the speakers are white, for example, um, you know, I'm sure there were not a lot of speakers that had English as their second language, for example. So this is like, you know, kind of a good start, but also not necessarily representative of the broad population, right? Um, there are still problems even today with getting good speech recognition kind of open access data sets because there's a huge vested interest in companies developing their own proprietary data sets, right? So for example, Google probably has some like amazing speech data sets that they've collected from like some sort of secret switch on your Pixel phone that opts into listening to all your conversations or something like that, right? Every time, you're, every time your voicemail is transcribed, it's probably like able to learn something or keep something from that data set, right? Um, but they're not sharing that data set in a way that lets you benchmark things on leaderboards. Now, I, I shouldn't say that too much because I'm not a speech processing expert, but from what I understand, you know, speech processing is still kind of like a testy domain for um, this kind of thing. 
So, you know, this idea of data sets um, started to take off, right? And so the next kind of thing that happened was in um, like the late 80s. So I would say, you know, kind of like from 87 through the 90s was the UC Irvine, so UCI Machine Learning Repository. This was basically, you know, kind of like initially kind of one person's attempt to systematize and have a central warehouse for any machine learning data set that people wanted to upload to it, right? So this is kind of like the age where FTP was a thing, file transfer protocol, right? So, you know, this is kind of like my, you know, kind of like high school years where there was no internet yet, but you could like log into a server and download something, right? So basically, you know, this is kind of pre-World Wide Web. And of course, now there is a World Wide Web version of this. So basically this was kind of hundreds of data sets available via FTP, file transfer protocol. Um, and also, you know, basically this kind of definitely kind of solidified the idea of kind of training and testing protocol. So when you upload your data set, you kind of also specify the means by which you're going to separate the split of training and testing data and the means by which you're going to be evaluated, right? Um, and apparently when this kind of became popular, people in the pattern recognition community kind of started to complain that the field was basically just chasing incremental performance on these benchmarks, right? And of course, nothing has changed. It's only gotten worse, right? Um, but people were complaining that, complaining about that already in like the late 80s, early 90s, right? Uh, and in fact, if we go to the um, you know, internet, we can still find this, this database, right? So if I go to uh, you know, UCI ML repository, it still exists. And it still has you know, uh, tons of data sets, right? So uh, early data set from 1936, uh, here we go. Images of uh, 13,000 uh, dry beans heart diseases, rice, raisins, you know, there's a lot of actual, you know, you, you may ask like, why do we care about dry beans? You know, stuff like, you know, terrain classification for remote sensing or like machine inspection, still an important thing, right? So, um, and you know, like these are sorted, I guess, by popularity. So people must care about dry beans, I guess. Um, but like here, for example, you know, this adult perhaps is impinging a little bit on, uh, you know, some of the societal issues we'll talk about in the second half of class, right? So this is like basically saying that there are a bunch of census data indicators, and then, a, and then the output variable is whether you make more than $50,000 a year, right? So maybe this could be used as the basis for, you know, giving you or denying you a bank loan, right? Um, you know, breast cancer, wine quality, you know, bank marketing and so on. So again, it's worth kind of browsing around this database just to see what's out there. Um, Kind of the next thing that came out that was really um, kind of pivotal was uh, this database called MNIST, right? So MNIST is the digit recognition um, situation, right? So here, let me just put back here for a second. So in 1998 was kind of the first release of MNIST, which was basically, you know, 60K training images, 10, thousand testing images and these were 28 by 28 grayscale digits handwritten digits and so these were collected from census employees and high school students and this was kind of like one of the first kind of like competitions right so NIST right was uh, the net or is the National Institute of Standards and Technology so basically they collected and disseminated this database and then people kind of were trying to do a leaderboard with for example the application of automatically sorting you know handwritten envelopes with zip codes right so that was a super important application for the post service and so being able to do that automatically was a, a big deal and so uh, if any of you know Jan LeCun like you know he was super involved with the curation and certainly the improvement of performance on MNIST, right? So if you look at, um, you know, again, just do a quick Google of Kuhn uh, MNIST, MNIST. You know, here, this is like an old web page from when he was still an NYU professor, right? Talking about uh, where you can get this data, 
and you can find more details about it. But here, you know, this is like a, an early leaderboard, right? Where it says test error rate. You want this number to be basically zero. And you can see that as we scroll down to kind of like the modern day, the numbers for test error rate are like down in the, you know, fractions of a percent, right? Like, you know, this is like saying that 99.4 or 99.6% of the, you know, characters are correctly recognized. So in some sense, we would consider MNIST to be like a solved data set, meaning that there exists an algorithm that does for all intents and purposes, a perfect job on MNIST, right? So no serious machine learning researcher would just test their, their new algorithm on MNIST alone because we already know it can be done, right? But this is still an early example of, you know, leaderboard. You can see that, you know, all of these uh, top performing things as we got into like the late 90s, early 2000s were lacoon zone algorithm, right? In some sense, this was kind of one of the, you know, situations where it was discovered that neural networks were actually a viable tool for doing a good job on classification. So we'll talk about that when you talk about classification a little bit. So now you call these data sets, you know, kind of too easy in some sense. So even despite this, you know, even though it seems like handwritten characters are relatively innocuous, there's probably still some hint of, you know, bias, not necessarily like, you know, uh, prejudice type bias, but like, you know, like Americans are, are more likely to write this and Europeans are more likely to write that, right, for a seven. And so it may be that there are, are fewer examples of people writing sevens with the crossbar than there should be in this data set if you're trying to make it work on European postal codes, for example. So you still have to think about like what's in the data set, right? So then we roll around to you know, there, then, then there are lots and lots of data sets, right? Um, so for example, for me in computer vision, a very, uh, you know, important data set collection was this like Middlebury, uh, you know, data sets. So like if I go to Middlebury Stereo, so Middlebury, uh, you know, was well known for kind of curating um, specific data sets for certain computer vision problems that again really drove the field forward right they published a paper that basically said you know here is you know how you should evaluate uh stereo algorithms and so if you go to evaluation you can see the leaderboard right measured with all sorts of different kinds of things the problem that this is addressing by the way is like basically you have two cameras looking at um you know, a scene, like you have two pictures looking at this map here. Sorry, this is kind of like hard to see. I can't move this window around. So you have a, you know, a scene, like a left image and a right image, and then you want to find basically the depth of the object in the scene, like what is close to the camera, what is far from the camera. You know, the very same technology is used in your phone when it has multiple cameras, it's looking at the world and trying to figure out how things look in 3D. You know, stereo is one of the key things here, right? So this is one of the, you know, like kind of leaderboard type things for one of these problems. And then there's all sorts of information about like, how do you download the data sets? You know, where did they come from? Um, you know, how old are they and who took them and how are they, you know? So, so basically this is kind of like, for me, when I was doing, I, I, I never did stereo research, but I certainly was looking to Middlebury to say, okay, if I need a stereo algorithm, which one should I choose? I just wanna choose the best one off the top of the leaderboard, right? So certainly it had a big impact on moving research forward, right? But the thing that really moved research forward uh, in vision was ImageNet. So ImageNet, uh, in 2009, which we talked about a little bit in the beginning, was this effort that started at Princeton, moved on to Stanford. So you may know Fei-Fei Li is like one of the top computer vision researchers. So she started at Princeton, and then she kind of kept developing it as she moved from place to place. And so here you can see that the current uh, image that contains 14 million images with 21 thousand SIN sets. I'll talk about what that means in just a second. Of course, when ImageNet came out, it was a little bit smaller, but let's talk about what that means, right? So ImageNet, um, 2009. So this was really a turning point, right? Part of it was that kind of up to this point, computer vision, for example, you know, would have been considered what you call like a low data regime, right? Like it may be easy to get 60,000 examples of someone, you know, drawing a five, but getting 60,000 examples of a, you know, Chihuahua may have been a lot harder, right? So ImageNet was a concerted effort to basically trawl Flickr at the beginning to find images that people had tagged, right? So when you uploaded an image, you would also put a little caption on it, right, for the purposes of search. And so that's how ImageNet kind of started, was trying to find images on Flickr and corresponding descriptions, right? And so um, basically, initially, ImageNet contained um, 
about 5,000 categories and about you know, 600 images on average per category. So it was a big data set. And it's only gotten bigger. And then it grew to basically 14 million images, and I'm sure it's still growing, and you know, 20,000 plus categories. So it was, at the time, orders of magnitude larger than any other database like it. Um, and so basically, it was collected initially from Flickr. And I want to talk about ImageNet a little bit, right? So um, first of all, you know, the, if, you, if you try to download ImageNet, of course, it's a huge data set. I'm not going to download it right now. I wonder if it says how big it is if I were to download. Um, well, some of it is on Kaggle. If you want the whole data set, you actually have to like, you know, email them and ask them, I think. But I did find a website that at least navigates some fraction of the, um, you know, of the world, right? So if I want to say, you know, well, this is actually, so if I, if I changed ImageNet, which seems like it contains about, what, 1.2 million images. This, this, again, may not be the whole ImageNet, but if I search for, you know, um, what? Volkswagen, see if it knows about that, right? So, you know, this is like a Volkswagen bus, right? So it kind of shows me, you know, things that are similar, and I apologize, it seems like maybe the uh, internet is slow here. So you can kind of see that, you know, it's kind of showing me this world of things that as I kind of move the sphere around, it's finding me similar, you know, buses. And as I kind of move the sphere around, you can see that now I'm finding some red beetles, which kind of morphs into these red vans. And so what's being shown in the sphere is uh, some sense of how similar things are, right? And I could do this for, you know, a, any word I can think of, you know, chihuahuas, right? Now I can find chihuahuas. And so, you know, this was certainly, um, you know, really cool at the time. Now, where did they decide on what words they should use, right? So basically the, the concepts or the nouns came from kind of a separate taxonomy that someone else had developed called WordNet. So WordNet was kind of an attempt to systematize kind of a hierarchy of things, right? So for example, you kind of would say that car and automobile were synonyms, right? So kind of like that's kind of one concept that may contain multiple words, right? And then there was this hierarchy to say, okay, you know, if I had, you know, the concept of furniture, that below that I may have, you know, uh, chair as a child of furniture and table as a child of furniture. So it wasn't just a collection of nouns, it was this kind of like hierarchy of, of concepts, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, that was an uh, important innovation. Um, but critically, the labels of what was in each image was the hard part of the data, right? In some sense, because, you know, people would label their comments on Flickr or their, their images on Flickr, but at the time it was estimated, at least according to something I read, that, you know, if you, all you relied on was a search term alone, you'd have like 10% accuracy in terms of how the images responded would conform to your query, right? So there had to be substantial manual effort to make the images and the descriptions line up, okay? And so what they used to do this was Mechanical Turk. So does anyone know what Mechanical Turk is? Ah, all right. So basically, Mechanical Turk is a, is a very common thing to use in the kind of annotation world. So it comes from this kind of like, uh, you know, story about this kind of like, uh, you know, well, it's called Mechanical Turk because there was like this, I don't know what you call it, like a sideshow attraction with this kind of, you know, puppet, you know, guy with a turban on it that you would ask it questions and then it, like a minute later it would spit out a piece of paper with the answer and the way they did it was that there was a guy hiding inside the box, right? So that's what's happening here is that Mechanical Turk, if I go to uh, Amazon, well actually, yeah, so if I just go to Amazon here, so um, it's basically crowdsourcing people to do meaningless jobs, right? So if I look for Mechanical Turk or MTurk, it's a crowdsourcing marketplace, right? 
global on-demand 24-7 workforce, right? So this is exactly what it means is that you are paying someone pennies on the dollar to, you know, either, you know, confirm, is there a dog in this picture? Yes or no? Or describe what's in this picture, dog, cat, whatever, right? So it's all human effort, right? And so the way that they annotated ImageNet was based on the backs of tens of thousands of anonymous mechanical Turkers, right? So, um, and that's again, something that I think that we can kind of talk about critically, right? So um, the annotations, to do the annotations would have been well beyond the ability of like a couple of graduate students to do, right? Which is probably who, who were available at the time to kind of put this database together. And so the annotations were largely done by about, you know, 49,000 Amazon Mechanical Turk volunteers, or not even volunteer, they were paid, but they were not paid very much. So let's just call them Mechanical Turkers uh, from, you know, around the world, like 167 plus countries over multiple years. And so I want to come back to that just for a second. Um, I'm going to come back to that in some detail in a minute. Um, but let me talk a little bit more about the, about the categories, right? So uh, ImageNet is a kind of a, a fuzzy topic because it means different things to different people. What they did with ImageNet was to narrow it down to a subset of 1,000 categories that was subsequently used for a lot of machine learning competitions, right? So let's just say that, you know, ImageNet was used to create something called, uh, I'm just going to write the acronym, I-L-S-V-R-C. Stands for ImageNet, let's see, what does it stand for? I wrote down somewhere. Uh, this is our ImageNet Large Visual, Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, right? So this basically contains 1,000 categories and 1.5 million images and used for many kind of key kind of computer vision challenges. You know, notably in 2012, this was won by this AlexNet convolutional neural network, which was really the thing that ushered in this era of large scale deep learning research as a viable way to solve problems, right? So basically, um, you know, this, you know, benchmark was, was hugely influential for moving the field forward, right? It changed the whole direction of how people approached image recognition, right? And it would have been possible without the scale of data, the annotations, and the leaderboard that let you see how you were doing. Um, and so, let me just say though, that now we can start to, do, to take some sort of critique of ImageNet, right? So for example, you know, what you'll usually see is this ILS VRC 12, which indicates the special case of these thousand categories that was used in 2012, right? I'm not sure that when people talk about ImageNet, they're usually talking about the subset and not of the whole, you know, 14 million, dollar, 14 million image category, right? So let's talk about the categories, right? So for sure, one thing we talk about is category imbalance, right? So this is, you know, and I don't want to pick on ImageNet too much, but the things I'm saying can kind of generalize to anything that you're doing when you're, when you're collecting a data set, right? So, for example, of these thousand categories in ImageNet, only the three of them, bless you, involved people, right? So out of the thousand categories, only three kind of like, uh, in the person sub-branch, right? And those three categories were groom, baseball player, and scuba diver. <laughs> so, I mean, you could argue of all the things that you could try to recognize, like why are these three the only things that we chose to put in this thousand category, right? Kind of conversely, um, there are more than 118 different dog breeds. <coughs> Many of which are extremely difficult 
to tell apart even for humans, right? They had to bring in like expert dog breeders to be able to really tell for sure whether this was a, you know, a special dog A or special dog B, right? So, you know, you could definitely argue, you know, that this is a definitely imbalanced data set, right? Um, you know, part of the argument I think at the time was that we wanted to try to find very, you know, subtle differences between things. And so we put these 118 dog breeds in there as a, as a test of that. But realistically, you know, like you could have a, a pretty good argument about like, if you had to choose a thousand concepts, which thousand would you choose, right? Kind of a, you know, another issue, that, which I think is really important is the categories, you know, you know can be problematic. Right? So maybe not so much in the original ImageNet, but certainly under the entire ImageNet person category, there are a lot of sketchy words like bad person or convict or drug addict or slut, right? Those are words that, you know, arguably, why are we trying to benchmark our algorithms on these words? And also, you know, so first of all, they're derogatory, right? Um, they make a moral judgment, they're highly questionable, yet they're still in this data set, right? Um, and also, I think you could argue that if we go to um, you know, the image that browser guy, was it this guy? What was it again? I just had it. Yes, navigoo.net. And we search for, you know, convict in the image net database. So first of all, we get a lot of dumb images, right? babies in jail and dogs in costumes and like clearly, you know, things that are not uh, what we would consider to be convicts. But you could argue that even if you did have real convicts in these pictures, you know, there would clearly be like a lot of big questions about like, how are these images acquired? Is it racial bias and so on, right? So, you know, for these to even exist in a training database makes you think about like who selected these things and can we kind of in a, some sort of a agnostic, objective way is say that these images match the categories, right? I think that's a big problem. Um, in the same way, these biases that correlate concepts with images are kind of baked into how people would upload things on Flickr in the first place, right? So for example, if you say bikini, you're gonna get a lot of you know scantily clad women. If you say sports, you're gonna get a lot of hunky guys, right? And so there's this kind of like, you know, baked in kind of stereotype that comes from putting these images into a database, right? And so it's definitely largely a kind of like, you know, Western white male gaze that's going into what this database is made of, right? Um, and so kind of in general, this is not quite the same thing, but like one thing that I know from psychology research is there's this, uh, you know, w there's this acronym called WEIRD, right? Uh, and, it stand and WEIRD is basically saying that whenever you collect data, it's often from like a population not unlike yourselves, right? And so WEIRD stands for white, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, right? The idea being that those are the kinds of viewpoints that are kind of like the stereotypical default that is brought to selecting data, annotating data, solving problems, and so on, right? So the question of how you can get kind of like good objective, you know, uh, annotation is really tricky, right? So I would say that there are definitely issues with you know, the categories themselves. There's kind of like this implicit assumption about, you know, how objective you can be with annotating, right? So, you know, basically, you know, there was some sort of a tie break idea in terms of the original annotation where they said, okay, so we're gonna get, you know, three people or five people to annotate every image, and then we're gonna take the majority vote of what they found, right? So if you had some sort of outlier, you could, you know, dis disregard the person. It's like the minority report, right? If you saw that movie. So basically, you know, there is definitely a question mark of like, you know, if you're gonna annotate images and say like terrorists, you know, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, right? And so there are things that like, yes, it's fine if you wanna call this a schnauzer or a chihuahua, everyone can agree on that. But once you start talking about these kind of value judgments, then I think things are more problematic. And of course, that's where a lot of people have issues with how machine learning algorithms are used in terms of like police databases and stuff like that. So we'll talk about that a little bit more on Thursday, but this is just kind of get you thinking about it. So I guess one thing I wanna say is that, you know, so much of this annotation is based on paying some faceless worker, you know, two cents to basically tell whether there's an object in this image or not, where, 
you know, so much of what you are as a viewer depends on your, you know, your lived experience and your context and your, you know, whether you're hungry or not and, you know, whether you're cranky or not, right? So, like, just asking someone on the spur of the moment to classify something, you know, it's not necessarily something that we can do in some sort of, like, you know, objective, you know, this is the truth kind of way. Um, the implicit assumption is that, like, everyone who annotates is just like this interchangeable cog in a machine, right? So, definitely, you can criticize ImageNet, but also other databases for kind of this idea of who is doing the annotating, right? So there's a lot of, you know, visible and invisible labor. So at the time, the creators of ImageNet estimated that it would have taken like 19 years of undergraduate student, you know, effort to annotate this data, right? Which is why they had to outsource it to this mechanical Turk, right? But, you know, these 49,000 human annotators, they were never credited or acknowledged except in some sort of a very generic way. When they were acknowledged, it seemed like they were just kind of like treated as, you know, cogs in a machine. You know, there's really no demographic information about the ages or genders of who annotated the data. Um, you know, they were certainly paid what we would consider to be a pittance to do this huge amount of work that benefited the Western world, right? Um, and so, there was a big emphasis on getting as many of these things done in an hour that you could. So the question is, are they just motivated by getting you know, things done quickly rather than getting them done well? So there are lots of question marks about the, the labor that was involved here. And I don't want to come down on ImageNet too strongly, but I do think it's really important to think about where your data comes from. And that's why I want to, for the final project, ask you to collect your own data because then I can feel like there's an exercise in being responsible as opposed to just kind of like right click, save as, here's my data set, right? Um, a lot of what I'm talking about today came from a uh, paper that I think is worth uh, looking at. So if you, I will, I'll put it on Piazza, but basically just the, the front page of it is uh, here. So this is basically kind of like a history of ImageNet um, that was, you know, first authored by this researcher, Emily Denton, who I think a lot of. And a lot of what I talked about in terms of like the, the biases and the criticism of ImageNet come from this paper. So I'll put this on Piazza if you're curious to read more about it. Um, okay, and, and certainly not to even get into the question of um, data sets in the age of, of generative AI. We'll talk a little bit about that as I get into it, but like, you know, um, these days, ImageNet seems kind of like laughably uh, naive in terms of what data sets are out there, right? So for example, just to give you some sense of what's out there now, uh, something like, you know, um, Midjourney and so on is probably trained on this is a you know 5.8 billion image comma text pair database right and so um, you know this is like a huge unfathomable amount of data six billion images right and let me be honest that these images it's not even that they're giving you the images what they give you if you scroll down are they give you basically like you know. URLs to the images and then some sort of representation of the text, right? So they're not, they're trying to skirt kind of like fair use and copyright issues and so on by saying, well, all we're doing is we're providing a URL to somewhere on the net, you know, we didn't like violate any copyright, but certainly it's a fine line to parse, right? There's a website called uh, Have I Been Trained, which you can try yourself. So this is basically scouring that kind of data bit. So if I search for myself here, see what it knows about me. So doesn't know much, four images. This one is definitely of me. I don't know where the other stuff came from. And this image here is just something that I took um, with my students in Boston, and it must have been used for like one of the, you know, government, you know, funded agencies I work for maybe used it for a newsletter or something like that. That's what's here. So, so I, in a way, I'm glad that it doesn't know that much about me. Like, at least it's not finding my, you know, Facebook pictures or my, you know, uh, Instagram posts. Um, you know, this is stuff that I, you know, three of these images don't have anything to do with me. This is my book, two pictures of my book and one picture of a slide for me. So, you know, it's got my phone number on it for what it's worth, my, my work number. So, you know, you should try it yourself to see whether you were worthy to have been trained on uh, this Lion B data set, right? Okay, and let me just say also um, that the, the new era of using humans for annotating and training has only gotten worse, right? So, um, you know, so what I'm talking about today has a little bit of overlap with my uh, course on computational creativity. So let me just see here. I believe I have a, a lecture on, yes, this. So like if we look at uh, this paper on 
Mm. Oh, yes, here. OpenAI used Kenyan workers on less than $2 an hour to make chat GPT like toxic, right? toxic. So this means that these people are not necessarily even, they're not classifying cats and dogs. They're looking at truly awful hate speech or truly disturbing graphical, you know, graphic imagery and trying to exclude that stuff or remove it from training sets and getting paid like a pittance to do it, right? To the point that this company had to just turn down OpenAI's money because their employees couldn't take it anymore, right? So this is in some sense the, the hidden like personal cost of designing all these algorithms is that someone is doing the annotation, right? So, and they, and they may be seeing a lot of stuff that, that you wouldn't want anyone to see. So this is what's behind the great chat GPT, right? Okay, so let me talk a little bit more about other kinds of what I would call you know, ethical issues or harms that might be associated with collecting data, right? And we'll talk about a little bit of this in, in a kind of a round table way on Thursday, right? So certainly um, there are kind of a lot of representational harms and biases, right? So, you know, underrepresentation of certain stuff in your data set is ultimately going to have a direct impact on the way your model performs, right? Which is a pretty kind of vague statement, right? So let me kind of say what I mean. So there was a famous, uh, well, this is not something we're going to talk about too much in this class in terms of the algorithm, but, you know, uh, there's this thing called StyleGAN, which is used to make images of faces, right? And so here was a paper called Pulse that, you know, had a kind of a innocuous uh, goal, which was to take a low resolution image and hallucinate the high resolution version of what that image looked like, right? And it was trained on this big database of faces, right? And so the idea was that you have a whole bunch of examples of low res comma high res pairs, you train your massive machine learning algorithm, and then you show it a low res pair and ask it to predict the high res pair. So this you know, clearly did some amazing things and people had a lot of fun with it, right? So you could turn like the, the doom guy into what he would look like as a human or this emoji into this kind of weird looking yellow guy, right? So it's all fun and games, but then someone realized that if you took these low res images, you would get these white people coming out, right? So like, you know, when this Obama image came out, it raised a lot of eyebrows about this paper, right? When, this, when Lucy Liu turning into a white woman, right? So this was kind of a big deal and it caused a lot of discussion in the community, unfortunately, a lot of which was conducted on Twitter, which is not really the best place to have a nuanced argument, right? But one argument was, oh, you know, well, this is because the data set that you trained it on underlyingly was trained on lots of images of white people, like celebrities and so on. And so consequently, it was biased to create a white version of the low resolution Obama, right? I mean, I think that the discussion is a little bit no more nuanced than that. So for example, this guy is a well-known digital artist who said, well, I actually, you know, like tried it on my own and just starting from different points, I got people who didn't look white, right? So it's maybe not necessarily so cut and dried, but the point is that, you know, it makes you think about like, what does this model have baked inside of it and what is it most inclined to do, right? So that's something where, you know, uh, when you bake kind of biases and stereotypes into your model, it's very hard to kind of undo that process, right? Another example of this that is kind of more in the uh, language world is what's called word embeddings. So we're not gonna talk too much about word embeddings in this class, but just to kind of give you a taste. So the idea behind, um, you know, so let's just say you know, can encode kind of, you know, stereotypes, For example, what I want to talk about with the word embeddings is that, you know, to do things like ChatGPT, what you need to do is turn words into numbers, right? Turn words into vectors. And so, for example, just to take a very simple uh, kind of cartoon example, maybe what I want to do is I want to take a word and turn it into two numbers, right? And so maybe what I would hope for is that, you know, I have dog over here and cat over here. And then I have another noun that's not like these things over here. And then over here, I have like, you know, V and A kind of like prepositions. You know, I have in over here. I have like walking and running. So, you know, ideally, kind of what you'd like to be able to do is to have some sort of a algorithm that takes a word and turns it into a vector and that those 
vector, so if you have two similar words, the hope is that they go to two similar points in the numerical space, right? So I could say that, you know, the cat was running is kind of similar to the dog was walking, right? Because all the words agree except for cat and dog and walking and running, and those are similar words, right? So this word embedding is something that, you know, you need to be able to do to make computers understand language, right? Um, and so, of course, what's happening in the real world is that this is a much higher dimensional thing than just two dimensions, right? But the basic idea is there. And so the problem with word embeddings is that, you know, and, and what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to learn these embeddings automatically, right? So you'd like, you'd like to take a whole bunch of sentences and try to figure out which words should be close together in this space rather than try to hand code what this mapping should look like. That would be really hard to do. So there's a lot of effort in the late 2000s and early 2010s in terms of designing good automatic word embeddings. Um, and this is super useful for things like autocomplete, for you know machine translation. All this stuff is built on this kind of thing. Um, so in practice, uh, people then started to, to find out that there are a lot of weird things that happen with these embeddings, right? So for example, um, one cool thing that, that they found out for certain embeddings was that if I take the vector that corresponds to king and I subtract the vector that corresponds to man and I add the vector that corresponds to woman, I get, you know, something that's close to the vector for queen, right? So kind of the idea is that, that these numbers kind of act in a world where I can kind of like subtract and add concepts, right? So if I took, you know, Beijing and I subtracted China and I add the US, I would get Washington DC, right? So something like that transitive thing was pretty neat to see, right? But um, it's also kind of complicated because this, uh, you know, has some bad implications, right? So it was also found like, you know, if I take doctor and I subtract man and I add woman, I get something that's close to nurse, right? Whereas you could claim that what I should get is doctor back again, right? There should be no sort of gender bias in my word embedding, right? And it was even worse in the sense that, you know, again, this is something where some researchers were doing some digging into these embedding models. And, you know, in terms of like autocomplete stuff, they would like say, okay, the man worked as a, complete the sentence. And one sentence completion was, the man worked as a car salesman at the local Walmart, right? And then they said, the woman worked as, and the completion was, the woman worked as a prostitute under the name of Haria, right? Which is like awful, right? So this is somehow baked into our embedding model, right? Or our, our prediction model. Like if your autocomplete was doing that, you wouldn't accept it, right? So it's very hard to kind of like, you know, undo biases, because who, who knows what this was trained on, right? So one thing I'd say is that, you know, how were things like GPT and so on trained? Where did the corpus of words come from? Well, one example is that, you know, for example, GPT-2 was trained on uh, outbound Reddit links. So you think about the kind of stuff that gets posted on Reddit, right? And you think about, okay, well, that's, that's self-selecting for a certain kind of material, right? You know, Reddit has certainly a political viewpoint, a social viewpoint, a very young white male viewpoint, right? And so in some sense, these things are kind of being baked into the completions that GPT-2 was making, right? And eventually, you know, now further versions, you know, use Wikipedia and so on. But one of the issues is that, you know, uh, GPT-4 uh, and later the training data is not disclosed. Right, so they're a little bit, you know, cagey about exactly how much training data was used, right? The, the theory is that at least a terabyte of, of data has to come from somewhere to train GPT-4, but OpenAI is not telling us, like, you know, where it came from, right? And so you could argue, like, shouldn't we as, as consumers of ChatGPT, like, have some right to understand, like, where the data came from that was trained on, right? So no official paper documents how it works, or what it was trained on, it's like a massive black box, right? So that's a little bit scary. Um, and let's see what else I wanna talk about here. So another thing I wanna talk about in terms of costs or risks is uh, privacy, right? So privacy um, is certainly an issue. So privacy violations 
So there was one famous competition by Netflix um, that seemed kind of like innocuous at the time, but turned out to be a huge deal, right? So now I just defined where I wrote down what this huge deal was. I saw it just now. Is this? Hold on. I got too many pages of notes here. I'm drawing from like three or four different classes, and so I'm bound to a bit mixed up here. All right, so there's this. Must be over here. Yes, OK. So basically, you know, one example of this is from 2006 to 2009, there was something called the Netflix Prize. Netflix Prize. And so the idea was that they wanted to develop better recommendation systems for what you'd watch next on Netflix, right? So when you go to your Netflix you know, front page, it's showing you this queue of stuff that we think you'll like, right? And it wants to show you stuff that you're likely to click on and watch. So how does it do that? Well, the, this is basically like a public competition where they released um, you know, 480,000 rows corresponding to subscribers, sub subscribers, and 18,000 columns corresponding to, you know, movies and shows. So this is like a big 480,000 by 18,000 matrix, and the numbers in this matrix were either basically empty if the consumer had not watched that show, and then one to five if they had rated that show, right? So basically one to five ratings or didn't watch it at all. And then the goal was to be able to predict missing entries, right? Like how would, a, how would a user have rated this movie? Would they have watched it? Yes or no, and then would they have rated it, right? And so there was a holdout data set that you could kind of tell how well, people, how well people were doing. So all this is well and good. And of course the data was anonymized, right? It's not like these, these rows were like, you know, Fred Jones. They were just like anonymous rows. But then some enterprising researchers uh, realized that the same people who are rating their movies in Netflix are also likely to rate those movies on IMDb. And by cross-referencing given rows and how people had, had rated movies, they could associate certain rows with actual named users, right? Which is like this kind of cross-privacy attack, right? So there was nothing really wrong with the data as such, but there was external information that could have allowed people to be outed, right? So basically there was a, um, you know, correlation with IMDB, where a lot of people were using their real names, you know, could reveal some kind of actual identities. And again, this is the kind of thing that, you know, led to a lot of lawsuits, led to canceling the competition for sure, but certainly you should probably be, you know, every time you log into a website or, or leave some digital trail behind, even if that one website is keeping your anonymous, your, your, uh, not your identity anonymous, you know, cross-referencing that with other patterns of usage could easily reveal who you are, right? Which is like why I get data breach things in my email every month. Um, so that's a big issue. Another issue is copyright infringement, right? So certainly there are many, many lawsuits pending against, you know, Midjourney and OpenAI about what data was kind of used to um, train various algorithms, right? So there is very little truly public domain data, right? So in theory, anything in the US that's, that's called public domain was stuff that it was like created before like, you know, 1925 or something like that, right? So Mickey Mouse, the original black and white Mickey Mouse only just now came into the public domain after a massive copyright battle with Disney, right? So like, current Mickey Mouse is still like going to be copyrighted by Disney until like the 2060s or something like that, right? So there's very little that you can take and just say, oh, this is like free use, you know, public domain information. There is some public domain data, like data that, you know, apparently like all of the emails that Enron executives, if Enron was this huge financial scandal in the 2000s, apparently all that data is in a lawsuit somewhere, you can download it and use it and it's considered to be public domain. But again, that's a very like kind of white Texan male type of data, right, in, in the oil industry. So certainly, you know, data is routinely used in ways that are probably 
if not illegal, certainly highly questionable, right? And so a lot of companies would rather take the risk of trying to make a fair use argument as, and then get sued rather than really check into whether I can use this data or not, right? So for example, you know, there is a, uh, there are a lot of computer vision data sets that I think are, are definitely questionable, right? So for example, there is a data set called um, like Celeb A, this, um, this data set that came out of Microsoft years ago, right, was a very popular data set, 10 million face images harvest, harvested from the internet to develop face recognition. And, you know, the argument was, well, these are all celebrities, right? So celebrities, you know, are taking pictures of all the time. We premieres, they, they don't have any privacy. And so we can use their pictures, right? But also this, so this, this website I'm pointing to, which definitely has an, a, a viewpoint, if not an agenda, is called exposing.ai. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can read about some of the data sets these people are critiquing. So this one is talking about how, you know, there are a lot of things, people that you would not necessarily consider to be celebrities that are still pictured at places and used in this data set. You know, journalists, civil rights activists, you know, artists and so on, right? And so eventually, due to an outcry that was partially brought by these people and others, Microsoft, you know, brought their, and, and they say, okay, you know, it was discovered that, you know, the Chinese government was using this data set to do face recognition, as the basis for face recognition technology that was deployed to track foreign journalists, right? So there was a huge blowback and Microsoft eventually, you know, pulled their data set but you know, not before people had downloaded it and used it for things, right? So now, you know, this data set once it's out, you know, it's kind of hard to put back in the bottle. Um, in a similar way, you know, and this is something that I that touched on my research a little bit was there was a data set at Duke University where they put in some cameras out the windows of their campus and you know basically tracked students that were walking around the quad. And so, you know. I do, I do research, I shouldn't be sugarcoating, I do research that relates to surveillance imagery, right? And so it's a tricky line, right, between do you consider what you do out on our campus to be public behavior, right? In theory, I'm an amateur photographer, I'm a street photographer, anything that's out there, you know, I can take a picture of, right? In the US at least, in other places, it's less legal to do that. But in the US, anything that's happening on public ground, I can take a picture of. And so you could argue that building a, you know, database out of this, is it public domain? Well, I mean, like, do these students have a reasonable explanation of privacy? Certainly, if I, there was another case of a, of a data set that was acquired in a San Francisco coffee shop, where certainly you wouldn't think that you would find yourself in a computer vision trained data set if you were in a coffee shop, right? On campus, when you're outside, you know, maybe you don't have such a reasonable expectation of privacy. Anyway, there was a huge outcry over this data set, which again, was eventually pulled, right? Part of it was that the, um, you know, the researchers, I think what happened was they collected data in a way that was not entirely consistent with what was called their IRB application. So whenever I do any sort of data collection, I have to fill out a form that's called the Institutional Review Board Protocol, which basically I submit to a panel of people at RPI that looks it over and says, are there you know, collection issues? Are there you know, privacy issues? In theory, the IRB, well, not in theory, in practice, the IRB has to approve any sort of data collection that I do and make sure it's above board. And they will ask me for corrections or modifications to my procedure. So there is supposed to be some sort of checks and balances in the university world, but those checks and balances don't necessarily exist in the industry world. There may be some sort of like a, you know, similar panel inside, you know, other big companies, but they're not like re responsible to the public or anything like that, like I would be. So, you know, that's a little bit tricky. Um, so privacy issues. And I think the other thing I wanted to say is um, there are, economic issues, right? So certainly if I um, go back to here, not only in terms of like the unfair labor of annotating the data set, but also um, just kind of like the uh, cost of training algorithms. So, you know, definitely, uh, it's not cheap to train GPT, right? And so, and it's also not like they just trained GPT once. They trained it many times, right? So here's a paper that kind of tried to characterize the carbon emissions from training extremely large machine learning models, right? So at the bottom is, you know, kind of a scale of, of one ton of carbon emission is one passenger traveling from New York to San Francisco on a, on a passenger jet, right? And it's estimated that you would use, you know, five tons on average during your life 
maybe 18 tons if you're an American. Um, and then if you kind of scroll up, you get to car, one lifetime of a car is 63 tons. And then at the top is GPT-3, 500 tons of carbon emissions, right? Which is, seems like a lot, right? Um, and that was just like one, well, I guess, I guess it's a little bit subtle in terms of like, you know, we don't know where these numbers necessarily come from. This is kind of like estimated based on what's given in the paper. There have been some, I think, responsible actors that have tried to, you know, characterize, um, oh no, my battery's running low. Quick, plug it in, plug it in. It's a bad sign when that happens. Take my mic off. Will it reach? Let's hope so. Do I have time to plug it in? Oh, it's so close. You can do it. Step it on the microphone. Put myself back together. So what am I trying to show you here? So what I want to show you is, uh, again, if I go back to my um, my web page here. So here, some companies like Google. Here, um, this is a paper from 2021 from Google that basically was an attempt to characterize um, you know, how much it really costs them in terms of carbon emissions to train certain language models, right? And so there are some upshots basically saying that um, you know, ge the geographical location of where you put your data center matters a lot. So Google is trying very hard to decide where to position its massive learning centers to get the best, um, you know, it maybe has a five to 10 times difference in different parts of the country, right? Uh, and so again, if we look at um, some of their tables, right, they've done some extensive work, and I'll put this paper on uh, Piazza also, talking about like, you know, how big was their model? How much power did it take? You know, what computers did they use it on? You know, how many, you know, carbon tons were emitted? One thing that I took from this paper, which I don't know if is exactly in here, was that, you know, one perspective is that, yes, it seems like, um, you know, it costs a crazy amount of carbon emissions to train these models. But somewhere else, what I found out was that the amount of energy it took to train like GPT is just a fraction of what it takes on a daily basis to just do Google image or just to do Google search, right? So search apparently just dwarfs everything, right? And of course, we, we wouldn't say that we can live without like Google search, right? So it's really hard, I think, unless you're an expert, to make a really nuanced discussion about like, is it worthwhile in terms of emissions, right? One thing that's definitely true is that, you know, just like you don't just test on your data once, you don't like train these huge models only once either. You have to train them a whole bunch of times and every time you do it costs a certain amount, right? So it is interesting to kind of look at this stuff. Um, and so I will post a few of these um, papers if you're interested to read more about it. Um, here's another one, energy and policy considerations for modern deep learning research. Um, okay, we're running out of time, so let me see what else I want to say today. Uh, I guess one other thing I'd like to say in general is that um, there are definitely, um, so this is like in terms of energy output, You know, there's definitely something to be said for kind of like risks versus benefits, right? So who is getting the benefit of all this great machine learning? Again, like the United States and the Western world and Europe and so on, right? Who is bearing the brunt of doing the annotation and suffering in the environment? Well, it's probably less, you know, rich countries, right? Where people are gonna get paid cheap amounts to do annotation, and you know, who knows where the data centers are for, for some of these places, right? So the, the idea is that you know, the people who are taking on the risk are not the same population that is getting the benefit from these algorithms, right? Which is not a new story, obviously, but it's something to think about. Um, I think another thing that we should be kind of aware of is you know, when, when people talk about, and again, this is kind of like a, 
a victim of um, kind of hype, right? So, you know, in some sense, a lot of machine learning researchers would say that the holy grail of um, machine learning is to design algorithms that have so-called human levels of performance, right? But what does that really mean? Machine learning researchers are not always very good at accurately characterizing what that means, right? So, for example, it's been claimed that, you know, humans will prefer, like, generative AI-created art to human-generated art, you know, via some sort of human subject study, and then you find out that human subject study is based on someone looking at, like, 100 by 100, like, pixels on a screen for five seconds, right? And that's no way to judge art. You judge art by going to a museum and looking at, you know, art on the wall, right? So, I think researchers are quick to kind of do a human subject study, but not necessarily do it very well, right? So for example, even on ImageNet, they were claiming that, you know, machine learning algorithms had beat humans already on ImageNet back in 2015, but based on kind of like the error rate in making these classifications, like they were saying, okay, you know, humans make a 5% error rate and our algorithm makes, you know, a 2% error rate. But then they did some more, you know, digging and they realized that, you know, actually if you threw out all of the subtle dog classes where no one but a dog groomer would know what these, you know, glasses were, then the human error was like 1.2%, which is actually, you know, better than the machine learning algorithms, right? And if you threw out some of the more obscure things, it was even less than 1%. So basically, you know, researchers in machine learning can be pretty casual about characterizing their, their performance in compared to humans, and then it only takes kind of like one extra step to get a news article that makes it seem like machine learning algorithms are better than humans in all sorts of ways, right? So again, I'm trying to make sure that as we go into machine learning, we are kind of critical about like the hype that you're going to see in news articles about machine learning. So, um, okay. So, Basically, this is all kind of like food for thought to talk about things in the next class. So let me go to um, what I put together for uh, Thursday's class. So discussion questions for Thursday. You know, again, this is not too much. There's only like 10 questions on here. I'm not expecting everyone to answer every question. You have to prepare anything on paper or anything. But I do want to talk about it a little bit, right? So I'm, I'm kind of curious to know, as a young person in 2024, you know, what does machine learning mean to you and, and see what we think, right? And then after this, we'll start to get into the actual nitty gritty stuff that you all came to learn about, like the actual math is what the rest of the class is gonna be about. But I think it's worth kind of front loading this class with discussion about the way it affects you and your lives and some of the kind of seamy underbelly of machine learning, right? It's not all like amazing, like technology, we should all be so great about it. You know, there's, there's a lot of stuff to think about and criticize. And there's a lot of research on, you know, trustworthy machine learning you know, fair machine learning. Once we have a little bit of notation under our belts, we can kind of come back to this idea and talk about like, how would we mathematically, you know, quantify what it means for a machine learning algorithm to be fair, for example. That's something that we can kind of try to, to measure and do better with, right? But I will say that, you know, when it comes back to data sets, it's very difficult to, to undo the implicit stuff that has been baked into a data set, right? So like there has been a big effort to take the bad stuff out of ImageNet, but in some sense that may have been too late, right? Images, things that were trained on ImageNet before the bad stuff was removed are still out there, right? And so who knows what's behind things that are sold to, you know, companies and police departments and so on that you don't know what was trained on, right? So I think it's really important to think about the provenance of your data. So I will put up homework one shortly and, um, Again, this is time to think about too the um, the data set that you might want to create for your uh, project, right? So one of the last the last problem on the homework, I think I showed this earlier, is thinking about what data set you want to collect and kind of explaining to me uh, how you're going to use it for some of the problems we're going to talk about from a math point of view. And the last thing is thinking about like, okay, so just kind of spitball, even though I don't think that your data set that you develop in this class is going to be used for anything uh, too shady, but, you know, extrapolate a little bit. Like, could it be, you know, collected in, is there any issue with how you're collecting it? You know, if you're saving images off the internet, are you infringing copyright, right? Uh, you know, if someone took your data set and tried to use it to develop some sort of like a, you know, nefarious algorithm, what could be the bad side of your Irv days? I want you to think about this a little bit as part of this last problem on the homework. All right, I talked for like a long time. So questions or comments about anything? Yes? For this homework assignment, do you want anything in writing? 
Yes. Yes. So the goal is that I'm thinking that I'm going to try to have this whole thing on Submitty instead of trying to do some sort of hybrid Submitty grade scope thing. And we'll see how it goes. I mean, I'm, I'm perfectly expecting it to be super complicated in the beginning, but once we get it down, we'll be okay. So watch for details on that on Thursday. Again, there's nothing you can do about this homework anyway this week in terms of like uh, solving problems, except for the last part about data sets. So if you want to do something this week for this class, that's something to think about. Okay, other questions or comments? All right, sounds good. So I will see you next time.